Yesterday we talked about living things, and then we started to talk about this concept of spontaneous generation. Now, in your own words, who could tell me what was this concept, what was this idea of spontaneous generation that people once had? Go. Uh, in your own words, yeah. When you would like mix <laughs> things together, other things would just be created. What kind of things? If you would mix like bread and flour or something like that in a jar, of mice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What were you gonna say? Living things would be created. Yeah. That in certain conditions, non-living material, whether it's bread or mud or sweaty underwear and wheat, um, in some conditions they would turn into living things. That's what this idea was. And it was commonly held belief that living things could come from non-living things. Um, and it, we may find it silly, but it did sort of agree with many things people saw. People saw that if you left meat out, it just maggots appeared. Okay? There were no maggots there before. They didn't see any. They just sort of appeared, these worm-like creatures. Bread just turned into this mold. or. Broth turned cloudy and smelly and made you sick. In the spring, frogs would just emerge from the mud around ponds and so forth, when there were no frogs to be seen before. And so people thought that under these conditions, there is non-living matter that could turn into certain types of living things. And yesterday we read a little bit about Van Helmont and his sweaty underwear and wheat experiment. Anyone set that one up at home yesterday? Uh, Joey, you have one on your second? Yes. How would they the maggots? We're going to talk about that, actually, right now. So one of the first, we're going to talk about three scientists that did experiments regarding spontaneous generation. We'll talk a little bit about what they found and how they set up their experiment. The first is an Italian scientist, Francesco Reddy. He uh, was doing his research in the uh, mid to late 1600s, and he studied question Aiden just talked about, the maggots. Okay. And so the problem he was asking for thinking about the scientific method is, well, where, where do these maggots come from? He asked the question Aiden just asked. And people believe that the meat turns into maggots. Reddy had a different idea. Reddy thought that the maggots came from flies. So he set up a pretty simple experiment to test his hypothesis. And what Reddy did is he had three jars. And in each of the jars, he put a chunk of meat. Put a chunk of meat. In the first jar, he left it open, no cover on it. In the second jar, he covered it, but with a, a sort of gauze material, like a netting, a screen almost, so that air could still get in and out but not any flies. And in the last jar, he left it completely sealed. So after giving it several days, Reddy observed his jars. What he found is that in the open jar, okay, flies obviously were attracted to the rotting meat. They landed on it, and he saw that they were laying their eggs on it. And then a few days later, Maggots appeared. In jar number two with the screen, again, flies were attracted to the screen, to the jar, because of the odor of the rotting meat. However, they couldn't get into the meat. But they did land on the netting and lay their eggs there. And maggots appeared on the netting, on the gauze. In the seal jar, there were no maggots to be found. Bless you. So, what would Reddy's conclusion be here? 
Okay, he heated them to a temperature to kill the microbes. And we know that bacteria can't survive very high temperatures. This is why you are supposed to cook meat to certain temperatures. It's to kill any bacteria that might be in them. You probably learned this at home in careers, right? Yeah, it's good bacteria. Okay. What temperature should chicken be cooked to to kill any bacteria, Brian? 140 degrees Fahrenheit and above. Is it? I thought chicken was is 160. Oh, I got the oh, we didn't have a question about chicken. Oh. Beef? That's 140. Yes. So anyway. Heating kills the existing microbes. Sealing it doesn't allow any new ones to come in. Aiden? Does that happen like with all types of like liquids? Like the if there is a nutrient, if there's, yeah, if there's not, it wouldn't just happen with water. Like bacteria wouldn't start to grow in water because there's no energy there for them to consume. But any other sort of liquid, yeah. Kate? Um, was he the one who understood that like the one who found out about heating? Um, no, I think people have known previous to that that heating would kill any existing microbes. His part was the sealing of it afterwards. Can you go back? Our last scientist is a French scientist. He's famous. He did his work in the 1800s in, in France. And his name was Louis Pasteur. And Louis Pasteur was taking... Um, Spallanzani's experiment one step further. Again, he was asking sort of the same question. Where were these microbes coming from? But he had a slightly different hypothesis. He thought that they were not just floating around in the air, but he thought that the microbes were actually kind of hitching a ride on dust particles. Have you ever looked in like a sunny window and you see all the dust streaming through yeah. the air? Yeah. So those little particles are little bits of stuff from our environment. Mostly human skin, actually. Um, but on those dust particles, that's where Pasteur thought the bacteria were kind of hiding. So he came up with a pretty ingenious experiment. He used these special types of flasks called swan's neck flasks. And it's a, an open flask, but then the end of it has this S-shaped curve. The end is open, so the air can still get into this flask. So what Pasteur did is he, he put some broth in the flask and heated it up. Now, because of the shape of this neck of the flask, air could get in to the broth. But in this little crook of the bend here, any dust or anything else out of the air would settle here and not make it all the way into the broth. So this flask allowed air in, but it did not allow dust in. So when he boiled the broth and left it, no microbes grew. Years. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't look in this experiment. It says years. I don't know if that's actually true. But no, no microbes started growing. But then what he did is he would tip over the flask so that some of the broth mixed with some of the dust. And then when he let that sit for a couple days, microbes did begin to grow. So what is his conclusion? Francesca? That the microbes were carried by the dust and not the air. Yeah, he was correct. The microbes are actually on these dust particles. Because when air was in, no microbes formed. But when the dust got in, they did. So yeah, he concluded these microbes are carried by these tiny little dust particles. And so we know that this concept of spontaneous, after these scientists, among others, when they um, did these experiments, they showed that spontaneous generation is false. It is an incorrect theory. Living things do not come from non-living material. Where do they come from? Where do they come from? Then? Other living things. We sometimes say life comes from life.
Now, does anyone recognize Louis Pasteur's name? Maybe you saw it this morning when you were eating your bowl of Lucky Charms. Why would you maybe have seen his name this morning? Huh? Is he like in the medical pasteurization of milk? Yeah, pasteurization. <laughs> so if you look on a container of milk, it'll say that it is pasteurized. It's named after Louis Pasteur, who yeah came up with sort of the concepts of pasteurization. What does that mean? When it, your milk is pasteurized, which the milk you buy at the grocery store is all pasteurized, what does that mean? No? It's had all the bacteria, like, getting that, gotten the bacteria out of it. Not quite. There's probably bacteria in the um, milk that you drink. But you're, you're on the right track. Aiden? Um, it's like a way to, it's, I think it's a way to seal it. Or, no, they put like an ingredient in it. No. So, like, it stays good. For no, Dean? Oh, like, they heat up the milk and then, like, you have those huge machines that, like, that, like, stir it around. And then, I think that's how you get skim milk. The milk that rises and then you just skim the fat off. Yeah, you're on the right track. So, it's heated. Yes, the milk, they take milk from cows, collect it from different farms, send it to a place where it's um, prepared, and they heat it up. Why are they heating it up? Uh, to kill the bacteria. They're probably still in there. They're just dead. And then immediately afterwards, what do they need to do? Seal it. So all those packages of milk are all sealed up very tightly so that no new bacteria can get in. That's what pasteurization is. It's the same process by which we make canned goods. You know, you can have a can of beans that sits on a shelf for seven years. And you then open it up and it's fine to eat. It's not spoiled, there's no bacteria, it's, it's fine. Because it was basically pasteurized. Those beans before they were put in the can were heated up to kill any bacteria, immediately sealed so no new bacteria get in. And that's why, you know, canned goods can last for so long. So like if you have a gallon of milk and you don't open it for how many years, and then you open it, it'll, it'll still be safe to drink? No, milk's a little different. Milk doesn't stay good for a year. It only stays good for a couple weeks because um, because there's um, you know probably some bacteria and also molds and things that, that are in there that if they can't keep it all out. Um, that milk is is not good for that. I mean, there are types. It depends on. I shouldn't say that. It depends on the type of pasteurization. Milk you buy in the refrigerator section is pasteurized differently. Do you ever see the milk you buy off the shelf? Oh, like yeah, Parmalat, it's in like a little foil so box. Yeah. Or you can buy like those little chocolate milks, um, yeah. but they're not refrigerated, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're um, pasteurized in a different way. They're heated to a higher temperature, and so they stay good much, much longer. But some people say it alters the flavors, it changes the vitamin content. Whereas milk you buy out of the refrigerator is pasteurized at a lower temperature, and so it's not good for as long, but some of those other things don't come in. All right, along these lines, you know, in, let's say, medieval Europe, people noticed that drinking water from natural sources sometimes caused people to become sick with digestive illnesses. However, if they take the same water and use it to brew beer, the beer never gave people those same problems. So why? If it's the same water from the same source, why did the beer, in fact, they even brewed special types of beer with lower alcohol content to give to children. Okay. So why, what, what is happening there? Grace? Um, well, they're heating the water, so like the bacteria gets out. Yeah, anyone's parents homebrew ever? Yes. I made beer at home. He's got his own like Curtis is the one making me check. So when you, if you brew beer, if you've ever seen somebody brewing beer, I've brewed beer in my kitchen before, um, what do you do? Oh, it smells good. I think it smells good. You get a big pot of water. What dead is in the garage? No, what do you, what do you add? What is beer made of? Um, you add um, like hops. 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 My dad Malted barley. Hops. Sometimes it comes as a syrup. That's the sugar part. Hops water. give a beer a bitter taste. Water. water. 
The yeah. yeast comes later. So you take yeah. the malted barley or the malted barley syrup, you take the water, eventually the hops, and you boil it all. Get it all mixed and you make this liquid. It has no alcohol in it, it has sugar in it and stuff. Um, and then you pour that into a big container. You add yeast, yeast, yeast consume the sugar from the barley and use it to produce two things. Alcohol. Alcohol and carbon dioxide. And that's why beer is carbonated. Yeah. And it's why it has alcohol, because the yeast are consuming sugar. Alcohol and carbon dioxide are the byproducts. And so that's how you brew beer. So the process involves, like Grace said, boiling. And so by brewing beer with this water that was contaminated, they're actually killing any bacteria and then sealing it so it was safe to drink. Now what could they have done that would have accomplished the same thing without giving children beer? Ryan? Yeah, just boil the water. Has anyone ever had in your neighborhood a boiled water advisory? Yeah. yeah. If like there's a water main break or something? There was one not long ago, like two yeah. months. So what they, what they, the reason they do that is they think there may have been a chance that bacteria are in your water supply. So they tell you any water from your sink that you're going to drink, you should boil it first. And again, boiling it will kill any microbes, any bacteria that might make you sick. Can you get water what about water? if you purify Hold on one sec. I think it's going down in Brooklyn right now. Oh, really? Boil water advisory? It, it had them in Connecticut. I think yeah, it's a lot of times. It's going down in Brooklyn here, though. Yeah. 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 It like oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, same thing. You cover the old all right, you're not the only one. You're gonna do it some the other day. All right. Boy, I don't know that. All right. So we're gonna shift gears here for a little while and move on to our discussion of evolution. Who's this guy? Charles Darwin. What is this thing? Parrot. No. A mutation. No. No. No, no maybe. It's a dinosaur. It's a raptor. Sort of. Wait, it's, 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 it's a bird. It's a bird and a dinosaur mixed together. It's Birds evolved from dinosaurs. This is a, 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 a important and famous fossil. This is like a recreation of it called Archaeopteryx. Oh, means ancient bird. Archaeopteryx oh, is a fossil that scientists found that helped them see the transition between reptiles and birds. Birds split off and evolved from reptiles. Archaeopteryx was a fossil that showed some characteristic of birds, like feathers and wings, but also some characteristics of reptiles, like claws at the end of its wings, like teeth in its mouth, like scales on its face. So it was an intermediate fossil that showed the transition from reptile to bird. And that's an example of evolution. So evolution itself is scientific theory that species over time change. So you write this. So the, it's been well proven through many experiments, observations, and previous to evolution becoming widely accepted, many people thought that species do not change. That the species we have on Earth today have always been here and have never been any different. They thought that species were static and never changed. As scientists started to study evidence, started to think that, well, maybe that's not correct. Species may not have always looked exactly as they do today, and over time, they may have changed, and we know they have. And evolution can explain to us where the wide variety of different types of living things on Earth came from, how they are related to each other. Why are certain organisms so similar to each other? Why are others so different from each other? Evolution can explain the diversity of life on Earth. And so today we're going to just talk about some of the types of evidence we have for evolution. How do we know this is true? Because most of this is, when we talk about evolution species changing over time, we're often talking about a time scale that goes back millions, tens, 
hundreds of millions of years ago, to a time before there were any humans. There was no record, written record, or drawings of what things were like on Earth 20 million years ago. So how do we know anything about it? How do we know species today are different than they were 20 million years ago? Grady? Um, yeah. One of, the, one of the first types of evidence that led people to start to think about evolution is fossil, the fossil record. What is a fossil? skeleton, sometimes it is. It's sort of the traces of organisms that lived in the past. Sometimes it's fossilized bone. Sometimes a fossilized imprint of an animal. Um, there's lots of different ways that fossils can be formed. Like this would be an example. This is not real, but this would be an example of a fossil that one might find of a trilobite. A common animal with all across here, very widespread, but they're no longer around. They are extinct. And so scientists found fossils of these trilobites for a long, long time. And they know that they're no longer around. So it tells us species are not static. We know if we look at fossils of horses from 10 million years ago, they were not these large creatures that you could ride from place to place. Horses were once dog-like creatures. They didn't have hooves. They had separate toes. We know that giraffes evolved from ancestors that did not have necks that were 8 or 10 feet long. They evolved from more normal sized necks, or what we think of as normal. And so we can tell what species looked like in the past. We can look at fossils and sort of trace back how things have changed. We see that some species have become extinct. New species arise over a period of geological time, over millions and millions of years. And so that helps us understand how species have evolved. You know, fossils are generally found in sedimentary rock, which you probably learned about in elementary school. So if you find a fossil, what can tell you how old it is? So if you find some fossil, how can you possibly know if it's from 2 million years ago or 200 million years ago? Jake? Like how far down it is? Yeah. Where do you find the oldest fossils? The yeah, the lower, the deeper layers of the earth, these layers were put down one after the other, the deeper the layer, the older the fossil. We can also date fossils by the type of rock they're in, by looking at various elements found in them. Okay, radioactive dating, carbon dating. Um, these can help us to actually pinpoint when a fossil uh, is from. So fossils give us great evidence of evolution that species have changed over time. Another, yes, Grace? Um, like that bee that was in that book. Yeah, oh. What is it that he's in? That's amber. Um, amber is basically like sap from a tree. Sometimes insects were trapped in, and it sometimes fossilized into rock, and so they're trapped in this sort of uh, amber. No. It's like you ever see Jurassic Park. You know, they, yeah. they take the blood from the mosquito that was trapped in amber. Um, so yeah. Another great type of evidence that helps us understand that species have evolved, but also how species are related are their structures, common structures. What we find is that when we look closely at various species, we see many similarities, even in species that might outwardly appear to be quite different from each other. For example, if you think about your own arm, human arm, we have one upper arm bone, right, our humerus. We have two forearm bones, the ulna and radius. We have a bunch of wrist bones, tiny little wrist bones, the carpal. We have our phalanges, our finger bones. Okay? So that makes sense. But if you look Look at this wing of a bat, which you might say, well, that's quite different from a, a human arm. But when you look inside of it and you look at the bone structure, it's actually quite similar. We have one upper arm bone, 
we have two forearm bones, all non radius. We have the wrist bones, and actually, the fingers and skin is stretched over them to form the wing, but it's basically the same structure. If we look at a whale's flipper, you may think it's just like a fish's fin, but it's not at all. When we look inside of that flipper, we have a humerus, all not in radius in there, wrist bones, and even finger bones. Now they're all covered with muscle and fat and skin, so you don't see the bones in there, but all the bones are there. So why would a whale and a bat and a human have similar bone structure? They're very different animals, live in completely different places. Katie? So you might have evolved from like kind of the same thing, but it's put on there. Yes, that's exactly right. We have a word that we use all the time for this. They evolve from a common ancestor. That's the term we use. That if you trace back the evolutionary path of humans and bats and whales, at some point, fairly long time ago, they shared a common ancestor that split off into these various groups. Okay. You see that limbed animals, land animals, evolved from lobed fish, fish that had fins um, that they used to start to walk on land. Uh, you might not have those pictures. We know these vegetables all come from one common ancestor, wild mustard is the same ancestor of broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower. All right, we also know species have evolved and how they're related by their distribution, where they're located. Species that live in the same area often have very similar characteristics. They may look similar, have similar adaptations. Species that have evolved on isolated areas on islands or in areas where there was not a lot of movement into or out often are quite unique. Which continent would you say is the most unique organisms? Joey? Africa. I would say not quite. Dean? Asians? No. In? Australia. Australia. Why Australia? Because it's separated. It's separated. The, the organisms on Australia have been separated for millions and millions of years, and they all took sort of slightly different evolutionary paths and look quite different. On the rest of the mainland continents, there's migration and movement back and forth, so there's some um, mixing of um, and immigration, emigration that caused some common evolutionary pathways to form. DNA evidence is also an excellent source. We now, using modern tools, can compare the DNA of various organisms. And when we compare DNA, for example, of humans and chimps, it's quite similar, 96% similar. Why? Because we share a common ancestor not too long ago. What if you compare the DNA of a human and a whale? Is it going to be as similar? No. no. Because, again, we share a common ancestor, but much farther in the past. So the more closely related species are, the more similar their DNA will be. And finally, we have these structures we call vestigial structures. You could think of them as kind of leftovers from the evolutionary past of a species. Let's take whales as an example. Do you know what whales evolved from before they were? Fish. See, they did not evolve from fish. They're no. mammals. Dolphins. No. No. Before they were aquatic creatures. Is it big? So that's yeah. no. So it's like a whale. Is it kind of like a horse? They're like wolf-like creatures. No. But they still have the remains of hip bones from those. Ancestors, even though they no longer have legs. Mm -hmm. Wolf-like creatures, yeah. Wolf-like creatures. 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 Yeah. Wol